that the rocks are coated with amino acids, carbon-based molecules that are among the basic building blocks of all life. But what conditions created these molecules in the first place? And how might they in turn create a living organism? Such difficult questions inspire scientists and artists alike. In the video game Spore, meteorites carry more than just amino acids. But the game doesn't address the question of how life may have been created in the first place. We kind of basically punted on the origin of life question, and at the beginning of Spore, you actually see life, you know, arriving on the comet. And it crashes into the ocean, and little shards of it come off, and down in the ocean, all of a sudden, a little single cell organism pops out and starts swimming around. That's the beginning of the game. There is, as yet, no proof of alien life having arrived on Earth. An important question remains. What conditions, on Earth or elsewhere, enable life to first emerge? Before life, there was no oxygen or ozone layer in Earth's atmosphere. Instead, Earth's non-oxygen or reducing atmosphere probably held some ammonia and methane, water vapor and hydrogen from evaporating water, and lightning due to friction from the heated gas. In 1953, chemist Stanley Miller designed an experiment approximating those conditions to see if life could emerge. He zapped a beaker full of early Earth's likely atmosphere. Methane, ammonia, hydrogen and water vapor with a bolt of electricity. He called it his spark discharge experiment. Miller's former graduate student, marine biologist Jeffrey Bader, was there from early on. Well, this is the original design of the spark discharge experiment. You've got this flask here, which is simulating a hot evaporating ocean. This water vapor goes up through here uh, into this flask here. This is where the gases would be a mixture of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. These are electrodes that we'll use to generate a spark in the system to simulate uh, lightning. As the spark zaps the vapor repeatedly over several days, the vapor condenses into a liquid, flowing down like a river, back into the ocean to start the cycle again. Liquid water is absolutely essential for life as we know it. And the reason is simple. Molecules need to be in contact with each other to have any further chemistry. And water is an excellent solvent. So it dissolves things. And once they're in solution, just by chance, they're going to run into each other. And then perhaps there could be further chemistry take place. Miller did not create life. But he did create brown primordial soup, the chemical goo that could be found on early Earth before life began. His electric spark broke chemical bonds in the gas. Eventually, those bonds recombined into hydrogen cyanide, along with amino acids, the smallest molecules, or building blocks, of life. Amino acids link together to form all proteins in living things. As humans, we all share the same 20 amino acids. Miller created five of those 20 amino acids necessary for life. It was a first, and it launched modern scientific efforts to create life in a laboratory. Miller started the whole field of what we call prebiotic chemistry, the chemistry that takes place naturally that produces the compounds essential for life as we know it. But it didn't take long for the scientific community to raise questions about Miller's experiment. Many believed his premise was flawed. Early Earth didn't have an ozone layer to keep out the sun's ultraviolet rays. So its atmosphere couldn't have held large amounts of methane and ammonia. Both methane and ammonia are rapidly destroyed by ultraviolet light. And on the early Earth, there would have been ultraviolet light penetrating all the way to the surface. So all of a sudden we were back to, gee, maybe this experiment was not relevant to the Earth. 
While continuing his work in the lab, Dr. Miller discovers something that changes our understanding of the origin of life forever. But the world won't find out about it for over 50 years. More than half a century after Stanley Miller first creates amino acids, the building blocks of life, his colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Bader, makes an incredible discovery. We found this old dusty cardboard box and opened it up and inside this box were all these other little boxes with little vials that were clearly labeled and associated with his 1953 experiments. It was just stunning that he'd I'd known him for 40 years and he'd never ever mentioned this and he'd never mentioned it to anyone. Miller had preserved the brown primordial soup, the amino acid results of his experiments, for over 50 years. Then Bader uncovers something even more remarkable. These results are from a second unpublicized experiment of Miller's. Miller had met the doubts of his colleagues head on. Initially, most agreed that methane, ammonia and hydrogen gases existed on the early Earth. But methane and ammonia could not exist in large amounts because of the sun's ultraviolet rays. So how then could amino acids have formed? Miller's answer, volcanoes. Scientists believe volcanoes formed the first land amid early Earth's vast ocean 4.4 billion years ago. Like Hawaii today, volcanic islands create their own microclimates. So when their volcanoes erupt, they spew methane, ammonia, hydrogen and water vapor into a plume. That plume, along with ash, creates friction, causing lightning. The lightning then zaps the gases before they're destroyed by the sun. All these gases, they would have been processed immediately. And so these volcanic islands were little chemical factories that were producing tons of amino acids, even though the atmosphere in general was not reducing, had no methane and ammonia in it. So Miller made a slight alteration to his original model. Instead of evaporated water entering the gas-filled chamber from the top, the water vapor now enters in a plume from the bottom, flowing directly into the lightning spark like a volcano. The first time Miller tried this, his results revealed just a few amino acids, so he moved on. But the problem wasn't in his results, it was with the limited technology he used to measure his results. So measuring using modern technology, it turns out the results are actually extraordinary. What we found is this volcanic apparatus, as we call it, produced the larger variety and in some cases more amino acids than the classic experiment. It was a major breakthrough. Yet, even if amino acids were created near ancient volcanoes on early Earth, that doesn't explain how they ultimately bonded together to form a living organism. Today, that process is performed primarily by one complex molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. We know it as DNA. Its double helix shape resembles a spiral staircase. The steps are made from base pairs of nucleotides. That's where DNA stores all the information necessary to build life. The earliest type of DNA was possibly one that could self-assemble, meaning it formed on its own, outside of a cell. And if biochemist Dr. David Diemer can figure out how that happened, he might unlock the secrets of first life. If you imagine something uh, over three feet long containing three billion base pairs, that's the amount of DNA in every cell of the human body. It's really quite extraordinary. So we're trying to figure out the simplest structure of a nucleic acid that would have the properties of DNA, the ability to replicate itself, the ability to be synthesized uh, right from the start. 
One likely candidate is ribonucleic acid, or RNA. RNA assists DNA in the building and replication of proteins in all life. But RNA's structure is simpler and more robust because it has just one strand of nucleotides instead of two. At the foot of an ancient volcano, deep in the primordial soup, perhaps some early form of RNA self-assembled, then helped amino acids to bond together. Without the ability to self-assemble, first life could never have emerged. Uh, Darwin himself suggested maybe life began in a warm little pond. Well, I would change that to a hot little puddle because we now think that the early Earth was volcanic and that puddles would be pretty hot in the 70 to 80 degree range. 70 to 80 degrees Celsius is about 160 to 175 degrees Fahrenheit. Any hotter and molecules disintegrate. Any cooler and the molecules don't react at all. So this hot, confined puddle is ideal for instigating chemical reactions. But can it break down molecules at one rate and bring them together to self-assemble even faster? Fast enough to build life's complex molecules before they break down again. To find out, Dr. Dima prepares small lava rocks with drops of DNA and RNA. This is a reddish uh, lava.